Good evening, I'm Ellen Ryan. I'm Senior Director of Strategy and Planning at the Fairmount Park Conservancy, and I'm just so thrilled to welcome you tonight um, for a very special presentation and discussion about Philadelphia's historic house museums. Um, so we're here with historian, author, architect, and artist, Frank Vignoni, and historian, author, and journalist, Nathaniel Popkin. The Fairmount Park Conservancy, as the nonprofit steward as one of the greatest uh, and largest urban park systems in the country, empowers communities to shape their public parks in ways that increase economic opportunity, promote public safety, support healthy recreation, and preserve the diverse environmental and cultural legacy of Philadelphia. This includes a remarkable collection of historic properties that we are honored to manage in collaboration with Philadelphia Parks and Recreation. So first off, we'd love to thank the Barra Foundation, particularly Christy Poling, who's here this evening, um, uh, for their support for tonight's event, as well as some related workshops that we're doing at the houses. We'd also like to thank Art Place America. Uh, the Fairmount Park Conservancy is one of six organizations in their Community Development Investments Program, and this is a substantial three-year grant to foster the integration of arts and culture into the mission delivery of, of community development organizations such as ours. So tonight's program is our way of kicking off the conversation um, about neighborhood and artist engagement in the continuing interpretation of Fairmount Park's historic houses. So we are really pleased to partner with the Philadelphia Society for the Preservation of Landmarks on this program, and you'll hear from Jonathan Burton, uh, Executive Director, later this evening. I'd also like to thank the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, in particular Paige Talbot, the Executive Director, Chris Damiani, and Alicia Parks, who's here tonight, um, for their assistance and partnership. And we're thrilled um, to have a sampling of 19th century watercolors uh, by David Kennedy and vintage photographs of the Fairmount uh, mansions on display tonight from the amazing collection uh, here at the Historical Society. So they're in the back of the room. Be sure to view them before you head down to the reception. I'd love to introduce Catherine Ott Lovell, uh, Philadelphia's Park and Rec uh, Recreation Commissioner and the former Executive Director of the Fairmount Park Conservancy. Catherine is a lifelong Philadelphian, a champion of Philadelphia neighborhoods everywhere, and a razor-sharp public service servant who lives to make our city great. We are so pleased to have her here tonight to introduce tonight's program, and um, I'll let me turn it over. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here this evening. Um, as Ellen said, I, I have the great pleasure and honor of serving as the Commissioner for Parks and Recreation. Um, I am uh, also the former ED of the Conservancy, and so um, just recently uh, became much more aware and engaged in the historic house movement and uh, all these amazing assets throughout our incredible park system. Um, become much more engaged over the last four months uh, when I became the, the Commissioner for Parks and Rec. Um, but um, it's just wonderful to see all of you here, to have this incredible crowd here. Um, I want to welcome Frank uh, here as well. It's an incredible honor to have you here. Um, Ellen gave me a copy of your book. It is on my bedside table. <laughs> Um, if it weren't for two children under the age of eight, I would have read it by now. I am on chapter one. Um, it is enthralling, and uh, I will absolutely get through it. It was my goal to get through it before tonight. It did not happen, um, but it's really uh, just, you know, really a fascinating uh, premise that you've put out there, a wonderful contribution to this field, um, and I think um, of great value to us here in Philadelphia as we um, look to really embark on the future of our of our amazing cultural and historic assets throughout our park system. Um, we have a, an extraordinary mayor, uh, Mayor Jim Kenney, um, who uh, has put out a plan uh, in his budget to um, invest uh, half a billion dollars in parks, uh, recreation centers, um, and libraries throughout the next six years. And it's a, one of the, would be one of the largest civic, uh, civic infrastructure investments in the history of our city. Um, and it's an incredibly bold mood, move for a, uh, a mayor who's brand new in his administration. And um, you know, when we really begin to think about what that kind of investment could, could be um, in, in terms of uh, really helping to transform some of these amazing treasures um, and some of our, our park spaces and open spaces as well as our historic treasures, the sky is really the limit. So. Um, but this is a very exciting time here in Philadelphia, and so I'm so thrilled to see this amazing crowd here. 
um, and certainly want to thank the Fairmont Park Conservancy that is our number one partner, and I am biased, <laughs> uh, Philadelphia Parks and Recreation, but also to see so many of our other partners here who help to um, manage and steward and champion um, our historic houses uh, throughout our park system. You have been there um, in the good times and the bad times, and we hope to have you um, for all the times as we move forward in this wonderful work together. So um, thank you again for having me here. Thank you to, to Frank and, and uh, for, for joining us here. Um, and many thanks to Ellen and the Conservancy for this wonderful program. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to introduce Frank Bagnoni, Principal of Twisted Preservation Cultural Consulting based in New York uh, and former Executive Director of the New York City House, Historic House Trust. Not only is Frank a public historian, architect, uh, non-for-profit expert and artist, but he has spent over a decade of his professional career in Philadelphia, serving as the executive director at both Bryn Athen Cathedral Historic Site and later at the, Pencil uh, the Philadelphia Society for the Preservation of Landmarks. And Frank is, of course, the co-author of the Anarchist Guide to Historic House Museums, along with Deborah Ryan. The book, already in its third printing since November 2015, takes a fresh look at historic house museums and how they can engage their communities with a wide array of artists, historians, scholars to keep their interpretation timely and vital. This sentence from Frank's book powerfully captures for us the book's objective. Our hope for historic house museums is that they be more than repositories of historical artifacts and information, that they be engines capable of having a positive impact on the community that surrounds them. That is the Fairmount Parks Conservancy's interest in tonight's conversation, and we know that so many historic houses in the city are innovative in how they interpret their collections, how they use their properties, and how they can appeal to the people who haven't found their way to the door before. As the authors say, there is risk in community engagement, but there is much greater reward in being a social institution. So I do want to um, also mention that we have cards on your seats. Um, in, in the course of listening to Frank's presentation, please take a moment to jot down a question and we're gonna collect those uh, after Frank speaks and we'll kick off a conversation with Nathaniel Popkin and all of you, so thank you. All right, let's get started. Can you hear me in the back? And before we really do get started, I just wanna make this really clear that I have been called a menace, an idiot, and most recently a seven-headed dragon of the apocalypse <laughs> to history and historic house museums. So any question you write on those little index cards will not offend me. Um, I've probably been anything, anything less than the seven-headed dragon I'm okay with. So you guys are fine. Um, the, the, the real issue here is that um, many people um, kind of don't know where to rest on this polarity of discussion. Traditionalists are full innovation, and there's a real kind of um, difficulty in placing oneself in this kind of spectrum. That's why I think people are having a kind of love-hate relationship with this book. You either feel like it's really addressing something, or you feel like it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, in actual fact, the book is interested in that middle ground, and we'll talk a lot about that middle ground um, tonight. I always want to start here, which is this children's book. How many of you know The Little House? It's one of my favorite books. So, of course, this house is really great, right? The um, family comes back to get it after the city grew up around it, um, and what do they do? they move it to some place that's almost exactly like where it started. And this kind of nostalgic idea is really where I think preservation and conservation and collections management attacks historic house museums and the artifacts that are housed within. We totally lose what's in the center. And we only think of that period of interpretation. So it's that one picture in the back and this one picture in the front. There's nothing in between. And so that's a lot of where this book is about. It's in that in-between space. What I advocate for is bringing that in-between space back to the forefront. 
Because I want you to ask yourselves how many lives, how many people, how many stories, and how many narratives are lost when those center pictures get darkened. Now this became really clear to me when um, we lived in Bernathan and we took nine years to restore our house. Um, one month after we sold it, the house was demolished and a friend of ours put these pictures up on my Facebook page. So now, of course, we were lucky, right? It was right during the housing bubble. We sold our house. We can't complain, right? Um, and I moved to New York City. Um, but there was a sense of loss about this. And so here, at the same time that I was spending so much of my um, kind of life working towards making historic house museums relevant and valuable, I lost something that was very valuable to me. And so there was all of a sudden a kind of emotional, intimate, tactile loss that I felt that I had never really felt with a house museum. Now, the second thing that really struck me, and I just want everyone to know that my lovely daughter is right here in the front row, um, as many of you do, you probably travel around on vacation and you visit historic sites and house museums. Well, this was a vacation and my daughter was with me and it was just the third house museum that we had seen that day. And so we were there and it was very hot and the tour was kind of boring. And the woman spent some time telling us why this portrait was so important, so valuable. Well, she left the room to go to the next room when we were all supposed to follow. And my daughter looks at me, makes this face. I think it's hilarious. I take out my smartphone and I photograph it. Bad, bad, bad. I can't photograph. She can't make fun of one of the people in the house. So the woman comes back, shames my daughter, makes us come up to the front with her and make sure we don't get too close to the ropes, right? Because she said, I don't want you to touch any collections item. Now, I didn't tell her that I ran 23 historic house museums in New York City and I had been doing this for 20 years. But what it did do was frustrate the hell out of me. How can someone who loves these places so much leave not happy? And so we got in the car and I asked her to drive and that's when I started to write down why historic house museums suck. <laughs> and that is the actual notepad that I wrote on while she was driving and that is the basis of the anarchist guide to historic house museums. We must consider who Thomas Jefferson the idea that Thomas Jefferson could have had a young mulatto mistress in a house overflowing with young children whom he adored is inconsistent with everything we know about the real Thomas Jefferson. His granddaughter Ellen said there are such things as moral possibilities. Moral impossibilities. <laughs> so the next time a historian tells you there's no documentation and that you don't want to expand the narrative to talk about things because we have no documentation, kindly bring up this woman. Um, and one year later, of course, the DNA testing showed that in fact, Thomas Jefferson had a significant, intimate, lifelong relationship with one of his slaves, Sally Hemings, and they had children. And a year later, they actually took a photograph on the steps of Monticello. Um, and so during the research for the book, five critiques started to gel. And this is the first critique. And that is that historic house museums really reflect a kind of social and political propaganda. They really only tell partial truths, and they don't reflect the communities that surround them. So this is a really heavy one, right? Because people are saying, we get your message, we just don't think it's fleshed out. We don't think that it's fully honest. We think it's partial. So the second critique that follows this one is about communication. How many times, if you're in the museum profession, have you heard someone say, I didn't even know that place was open. I thought you had to be a member to get inside. You mean that's a, that's a house museum? I thought an old lady lived there. All of these, you're shaking your head, all of these comments we heard. So this second critique is that house museums are just 
silent. I mean, to a house museum, communication is like a handwritten note taped to the front door. I mean, don't expect social media from a house museum. You know, and, and if they have a sign, it took 15 years to get, and it's bronzed and gilded. And by the time it gets up there, we know that the historic narrative has probably changed a bit because we have more scholarship. And also, social media and communication today is much more than just information. It's dialogue. I mean, we in just the past few years have seen the power of social media with the Arab Spring. So, so what you're seeing is the communication has such power to it. Believe it or not, it has the power to help these historic sites. The next critique is an interesting one. How many times have you heard that these house museums are just boring? And you go, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? I don't understand boring. You kind of do because you've been to house museums where sometimes things are boring. Well, so what, what I was interested in is, okay, later on we're gonna tease apart what is boring, but I started to look at what people do on their own, not for kind of educational purposes, what they do. Well, one thing is just look at this stat at the bottom. Three out of four Americans have not visited an arts and culture institution in the last 10 years, except when they do it for entertainment purposes. So the reason why people are visiting these sites are for entertainment purposes. Okay, what are they doing for entertainment? Well, here's, you know, International Pillow Fight Day, which is not in the big cities, it's all over the place. Um, and here's No Pants on the Subway, um, which has also happened internationally. <laughs> it's really great, right? Um, so, so if you think about it, what do these things have in common? They're grassroots. They're social media driven. They're through kind of communication that is kind of alternative. Um, and it's not a centralized kind of planning. The top row is quite simply the kinds of programming and events that you get at a traditional house museum. It starts to hint at what is boring. The next critique is that historic house museums don't look lived in. They don't believe real people ever lived there. They don't believe the stories that you tell, that they're over curated, and they're over curated to express the objectness of the thing, not habitation. That's really important. The objectness of the thing, not habitation. And our bottom images down here are just like how we all live. We got stuff everywhere. Sure, they had less stuff back then. But I doubt that it actually looked the way we express these house museums and sites today. Um, if you look at this stat at the bottom, a lot of people say, fine, people don't like house museums. We want people who love history. Well, guess what, guys? There's a 23% decline in attendance at historic sites. 12% decline includes college educated. So we can't fool ourselves any longer that these are people who are not interested in history. These are the very people who are interested in history. Something else is lacking here. So how many have been to Monticello? Really cool. I love it. It didn't look anything like that. Thomas Jefferson didn't live like that. There's stories of people coming over for dinner and water dripping through the roof on the dining room table. And there's all kinds. Of, I believe that as Thomas Jefferson came back, first thing he would do is take the portico down and start to reconfigure it with a new kind of sense of proportion. The fifth and final critique that really coalesced in our research was that house museums, they always look so perfect. I just gave you $100,000 five years ago. She's laughing. Why do you want another $100,000 from me? It looks the same as when I went there in elementary school. This is so true. For some reason, house museums don't like to tell people the process of preservation, nor do they like to tell people the immense cost of preservation. When we did our research, and I'll get to that, the single thing that people liked was knowing how these buildings were preserved and seeing unpreserved pieces. Um, and then I just put up some prices up there of just some minor little things at two major house museums. 
And so even just with these, these, um, these critiques, you know, I kind of just felt like we were these scientists trying to fool a cow into getting armorous with a painting of a cow looking back at a cow. I just feel like, you know, what we think we're doing, what we're trying to do is not achieving the goal. We're a real cow looking at a painting of a cow that's supposedly looking back at a cow. There's something wrong here. There's a disconnect. There's this kind of meta relationship that isn't working. What is it about this that isn't working? And so what we did is we jumped in. One of the first things that we started to do is that we started to have anarchist workshops. It was to answer the question, what do visitors want to do? And in these workshops, we only chose houses that allowed us to take the ropes down, let us sit on everything, unlock all the doors, go in the basement, go in the attic, go in all the collection storage, go in the executive director's offices, go in anywhere that you wanted. And we gave them anarchist tags, which you have on your seat. And we asked everybody, take a handful. For the next hour, you roam the house. Track where you're going. Drop an anarchist tag if you want to say something. It doesn't have to be positive. It can be negative. And these anarchist workshops became, nationally, the place where we started to get really good information. Why? Because we weren't asking for an exit survey. We were letting people roam themselves. We were finding out what they liked to do. What was the reality of the visitor experience? And we started to find out things that people actually wanted to sit on things. They wanted to open windows. People turned around furniture so they could sit at windows with the windows open. Um, the list goes on and on. This is at the um, Lincoln House in um, in uh, Janesville, Wisconsin. And the people loved opening and closing the shutters, the kineticism of houses. How many times have you actually touched anything moving in a historic site? So the anarchist workshops became the kind of center fulcrum from which a lot of our tools existed. Um, another one of our um, tools was the imagination, excitement, and energy register. You know that question, they're just boring? Well, that's a really hard thing to figure out, right? So what we did is we said, OK, I want you to look at these three ideas, excitement, imagination, and energy. Track your tour. Tell us whether it's low, medium, or high. And guess what? Show us, tell us what you're looking at. So what happens is the things that we spend all the time working on collections items, highly curated rooms, interpretation, guided tours, fully restored spaces. Those things are getting low marks. What's getting high marks? Unrestored, <laughs> denied spaces. You know, the list goes on and on. The exact opposite of what most of us spend our time doing at house museums. And most people rated getting the hell out of the house as a high point of their tour. <laughs> Now that's a problem, right? We don't want that. But we heard over and over again that people felt suffocated, physically and emotionally suffocated in historic house museums. They wanted to open the windows and they wanted to walk outside. We also asked people to do one minute videos. And this is an example of a one minute video. We asked them about their collections items. We asked them things that they like to have around, things that were meaningful to them, how they used them. And so we started to study what a collections artifact meant to a real live person. Did it mean something wrapped in acid free tissue paper in a garland box in the collections room? No. We also did one minute videos of movement studies and we were really interested in the effect of us having restricted access only in the hallway tours or if we're lucky you get just a little old rope in the room right so you can kind of go like this. The worst house was it was Morris Jamel Mansion and they have Aaron Burr's desk and everybody goes to see Aaron Burr's desk. 
Guess where Aaron Burr's desk is. Aaron Burr's desk is on the wall back here, and you can't get past the door. So you're, you're going like this, and you're not allowed to touch the paint, so you're kind of going like this to look at Aaron Burr's desk. I said, why don't you just move it out? Because the furnishings plan said that it needed to go there. A lot of our researchers felt like um, the place was just a kind of carnival-like atmosphere of denial. Don't touch, don't take pictures, don't sit down. Here's some plastic fruit, here's some drinks that you can't actually have. There was nothing real, there was nothing welcoming. Stand in the hallway for 20 minutes and hear a bunch of genealogy. You know, this was the kind of visitor experience. And this was another duh tool of ours. Let's track people when they go through the anarchist workshops. What do they do? Well, guess what? They don't stay in the hallway and they also don't just enter a room once and never come back. They keep going in and out. We had people say they never understood a house museum until they kept going all around the house, up and down, in the basement, from side to side. Really fascinating. Usually around 17% of most house museums um, are restricted. You can't get in them. And then the anarchist tags, which is the tag that's sitting on your um, seat. And I'm showing you just the Lincoln Talman house. These anarchist tags are important, as I was mentioning before. They're decentralized, meaning that all of you have an anarchist tag or a handful of them. You can say anything you want, I don't know who wrote it, and you drop it absolutely anywhere in the house. So that means what? That I can't track what you're saying, right? It's not the tour guide saying, did I, did I have, give a good tour? Yes, you gave a great tour, right? So that's one thing. It's decentralized and it's honest. The second thing is it's locational. You didn't get a chance to get locational information when you just did an exit survey or there's little sticky things that curators like to give you a frame to put your stickies inside of the frame. So they're even curating your crowdsourcing for you, right? So we said enough of that. We're actually allowing you to drop them wherever you want. And so what happens is you look at that floor plan, that's Morris Jamel Mansion, we actually track where they dropped them. And we're starting to find that people are interested in things that aren't even on the tour. Vistas out of windows, pieces of furniture that we don't even talk about. Um, and so here's a picture um, at the Mabry Hazen house of the stair where as soon as somebody started to give the standard tour, people just started dropping anarchist tags about how they were bored with it. We've also done, we've also done very specific research um, that when you use um, uh, unguided tours and the rooms are open, that inquiry and analysis skyrocket and interest in objects decreases. What's this mean? This means that if you allow people their own ability into the narrative, into the rooms, into the things, the anarchist tags start to be about relationships. They start to be about kind of analysis. Oh, this is interesting and I see how this works with this. So the anarchist tags start to tell us that relationship that we wouldn't normally get otherwise. So the anarchist tags are really valuable tools. One of our other tools was one minute videos of how you actually lived. So Marianne, if I asked you to give me a one minute video of your morning, you would tell me, I don't know if you've got pets, I don't know what you do, I don't, you know, but all of a sudden, if you keep, a, keep an eye on this video, all of these things don't exist in house museums. There's no trash, and if there is food, it's plastic, and it's nicely curated plastic food, right, on the table in the kitchen. Never see anything messy. And then we, we did a study, and we actually did this today, and I added you guys um, here, if you can see, the Philadelphia number. Um, we asked people for two hours in the morning to, um, to give us a, a sense of how many distinct activities they have in their house. And we define what distinct activities are, and we asked them to track it. And this one, we asked them to track how long they were doing that. I brushed my teeth for three minutes. I sat on the toilet for so-and-so. So the circles represent how long you were. Why is this important? Because we were interested in what it really was like to live, to habitate, to be in a domestic space. It's a lot different than me just standing there in the hallway 
than having a certain number of distinct activities in a two hour time period. Well, what we do is we start to collect all of that. We put it through um, a, a formula. Um, and we come out with this crazy thing of 153 square feet of habitable space per one discrete activity. Crazy, right? Well, what this means is that if I asked everyone here to define a visitor experience based on distinct activities, not a furnishings plan, not a historic narrative, not the tour guide script, but I want you to use the number of distinct activities that relates to the square footage of your historic house. You would be forced into analyzing and thinking about the visitor experience in an entirely new way. So you can see out of this crazy ass tool, you start to see this kind of entrance into a new way of thinking. It's a new way of interpreting a historic space that might, I just say might, have the possibility of enfranchising people to feel more comfortable that the space is actually more domestic. The big question is, okay, so those are the 0.0001% of the people who actually go in historic house museums. What about the entire rest of the world that has never even entered a house museum? What are they doing? What are they thinking about? Because what happens in the book is we have five categories. And the first significant category is the relationship of these historic sites to the community. It is probably the biggest donut hole for historic sites. And so what we did is we made mobile kiosks. This is my friend Olivia Cothran in Flushing, riding it around Flushing, asking them about the Lewis Latimer house. Guess what? They had never heard of it. They didn't know what it was about. They didn't know who Lewis Latimer was. <clears throat> and Lewis Latimer helped make the light bulb. He actually designed the filament. Um, and so she drove around, and this went on for months. Um, it says, what brightens your day? And people were able to write on this kiosk, what brightens your day? So instead of telling them about Lewis Latimer, we actually asked them, what brightens your day? What about you? Not what about Lewis Latimer, not about my settee, not about my blue and white dishware. And so this phase of research was about what was happening outside. Now the first thing, and this thing has always bothered me. How many of you know, know what I mean when I say the photoshopping of historic sites? You see these really beautiful romantic images of houses and historic sites and you get there and you're like, wow! I had no idea that there was a tire manufacturing company right next door. And this, this, was, up, this was up in Maine. I'm going to this um, Colonial Dame's house and the pictures are always so beautiful. This is like such a beautiful house. And you get there and you have to park down in this like hell hole and then you walk up these stairs and you're surrounded. That picture doesn't do it justice. There's, you think you're getting, a, I don't know what's it called, electrical poisoning or something. I mean, it's just like there's so much electricity there. And the same thing with, with um, the Frank Lloyd Wright house in Buffalo. I have always seen that house photoshopped so you couldn't see the neighborhood. And also Frank Lloyd Wright's drawings always show these prairie houses like they're in the middle of Kansas, right? <laughs> And I'm like, wow, look, that house is like right across the street. Um, and so also, whenever we go to historic house museums, um, one of the first things we push them to do is start with the environment. What's the context? What's directly outside? As I was driving to Strawberry Mansion today in the taxi, I actually took a video all the way from my place all the way down 33rd till I got to Strawberry Mansion. And that's the kind of thing I did right there for the Glessner House. From my hotel, I went through my trip through Chicago to get to the Glessner House. And we don't deal with that. We think that people are able to kind of push that out of their minds. Well, guess what? They don't push that out of their minds. And the second thing is, it's so ripe for real, useful, relevant narrative. And, and this was a house in um, upstate New York, the Red um, Square. 
Um, it was at this major intersection. This video here shows you a sped up version. Standing at the main window, you've got all these tractor trailers going and they just told you to just kind of ignore that sound. They shut the window. And what I did is I opened the window and I did a little research and I found out, and that's why this picture above, that this was actually a stagecoach stop. This house was always tied to transportation. And in fact, this house was turned into a gas station. So it was even, and they got rid of the gas station and they only talk about when the house was originally built. So my suggestion, that the house is about transportation. That I couldn't have gotten to that unless I looked at that map, I opened that window, and I started to think that those trucks were part of my historic narrative. Now, and here are two houses, um, my, my friend Jonathan there running uh, Philadelphia Landmarks right now. This was actually 2007. Um, what we did is a year-long survey. We actually sat on the stoop. We counted the number of people. We extrapolated, of course, um, but it was over a year. Um, and out of 422,000, maybe 423,000, 0.28 entered the Physic House. Now that included weddings. That wasn't just tours. And look over here at the Powell House. And we also tracked where everybody was walking and we followed them. Guess where they were going? You know, they were going down for cheesesteak down here and they were going to the Constitution Center, the big circle at the top up there. But guess what? They walk right in front of the Physic House. Well, he's shaking his head because he knows. Um, we started doing innovative programming, um, and I know that attendance has, has grown since this time significantly, but this was an eye-opener. We thought we were doing everything right. We're right, you couldn't be in a more strongly tourist site. And those numbers are so low. And it might be interesting later to even talk about um, what those attendants are, but we also have done studio classes where students have designed what mobile kiosks could be for house museums, um, shaped like a little house, going out, getting oral histories. We use the term transposition, which is leave your sight. Go somewhere unexpected and do it often. Build it into your job description. It's not an additional thing. It is the fundamental core concept of a historic site. If you don't understand your neighborhood, then you're probably gonna have problems paying your bills because we call it the donut. In New York City, it's like six blocks, but here it could be six miles, I have no idea. Um, um, and that is that most people know nothing about your site. You can ask those questions, they're like, I don't know. They live right next door. I've never been inside. If you, if you engage those people and understand what's relevant and important to them, that they can actually help your long-term stewardship. So this is how we started to understand how big this problem was. And so this is really a kind of just a, a sampling of what's happening outside of house museums, socially. You know, we've got the man in San Francisco who's just saying, screw it, I'm turning my apartment into a house museum. It's more interesting than most house museums. You can go there, put your feet up, and watch TV with him. <laughs> we know what's happening with Black Lives Matter. This issue of what was important before is now being taken down and attacked. So there's real kind of transition that's occurring outside of house museums. Interestingly, I'd ask all of you to go down to Alabama, which I just did, and go to many of the plantations and tell me how many of them actually say slave instead of servant. And then when you bring it up, they go, well, they were really nice to them. Um, also, this is a picture of Harvard's president's house, um, um, guerrilla tagging. This is happening outside of the museum profession. It's happening outside of historic houses. Um, these kind of museum tags are, are being taped up on houses. Um, this one says, yeah, but these are the names of the slaves that lived here in this year. Um, interestingly enough, Harvard just turned this into a bronze plaque and put it up on the house. So there is an effect but you can see it's not happening from inside the profession. Um, and right now, you know, you don't really need us. You don't need house museums. You don't need history museums. You can pay $200 and get your own DNA and you become history. Individualized, granular, it's all about you. 
You don't need other people. This is an interesting thing, and we'll talk more about that. And also, you know, things like the Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings issue, just published this past year is this book about a female couple, lesbians, who portrayed themselves as married in the colonial era. They introduced each other as wives. Now, this just was never written about, but it is now historic fact. So we just approved same-sex marriage. It's a relevant contemporary issue, and this comes out. So you start to see how history is trying to like catch up with what social history is doing. Um, and at the top, of course, is the Guggenheim, and what's valuable about this is our institutions are no longer valued for the traditional contents. They're being judged by labor practices, right? I brought my daughter to the Gamble House, beautiful house, rainforest woods. I thought it was spectacular. First thing she says when we leave, how many rainforest trees were destroyed to build that house? I'd never thought about it. So this kind of um, shift in younger generations that it's not just about the beauty, it's not just about the narrative, but it's about today, relevant, the questions today. And so, and so you know, at the bottom here, we've got these um, radical brownies. This is like the brownies, except they're getting patches for social justice. They're getting patches for helping the downtrodden. They're not getting patches for needlework. So all of these things, think of this slide as all of this stuff happening as constellations around house museums and historic sites. And historic sites are firmly implanted in the center, sticking to their period of interpretation. 1820, nothing else. So also what's happening, bricks and mortar is moving away. They're now mobile. This is a new um, historic society in Soho, which is producing three of these, and they're just moving them around. Is my history truck friend here? There you are. I, did you get my text that I was in? Um, things like this are really happening. You know, it's like an exploded transposition. It's like the thing, the house, the objects, are not as important as the people, as the narratives, as the stories. And you know what? We're going out to them. They're not gonna come to us. You know why? Because they're not coming to us. That there's a very different sense of welcome when you drive your truck to the neighborhood and you say, I value you. When she takes that to the corner with Prada on the corner, there's a different statement there than somebody who goes out of their way to the Soho um, Historic Society. Now these are really interesting um, because these are happening at really kind of outside of preservation in the museum practice. Um, this is 3D printing of pieces that were destroyed by ISIS. Um, not only is the 3D digital printing interesting in itself, but there is a computer chip in the back of this. So if and when it gets destroyed, that they can duplicate it. That there is a kind of acknowledgement of time, decay, and death and it's being embedded into preservation. This is our friend Jorge from uh, Columbia, who's now the new dean, right? Um, and uh, and uh, he actually values the debris, the dust. Um, this is taken from the inside of that column um, and pulled off. So the dust and debris actually becomes the artifact in itself. The granular stuff we got rid of and we cleaned off now becomes the object itself. And this is a totally digitally um, um, comprised um, uh, reproduction of King Tut's tomb that travels around with King Tut's um, sarcophagus. Um, and what's interesting here, of course, is that we're blurring the edges of authenticity. We're blurring the edges of what's real, what's not, what people value. What do they really want to get out of something? So again, something that's happening outside of our profession that every individual's history and narrative is of value. And you're starting to see it in a lot of kind of pop, pop culture things like this one. Um, and the next one is a really um, interesting project. Oh, 
a hope will commemorate the lives and the stories that homes contain. Think of your home, think of your house, the stories that are told. This memorial homegoing service will coincide with the building demolition as an opportunity to celebrate the lives of the homes that this home has served. is the last year of his home's life. And so this is an opportunity to commemorate the stories and the families that live in that home um, and to give it a proper memorial service. We are here to remember the past. We are here to reflect on the present. We are here to look for the future. I think this is one of one of the most powerful public history projects um, that I've seen. Um, and what's interesting here is it's all about everything that we do, except the communication of the message couldn't be more different. Now, it doesn't mean that we get rid of everything and we demolish everything. It just means that we open ourselves up to the possibility that there may be different ways of conveying information about preservation and narratives. And so what this did eventually, after a long time of writing and researching, um, I stand to you probably six years later now when we started the researching, um, is that we produced um, this matrix that has the five quadrants. And remember those five critiques? What we did is we broke those down into five quadrants. We defined those things. We associated markings with those. And we said, hey, these are things that kept coming up. Let's make this a kind of self-analysis tool. Um, at this bottom disk, you see one that's kind of filled out. Um, and so, so this really became the kind of um, end product of the anarchist guide. It was really about you can do this yourself. We suggest that you think about these ideas, but the important point here is you can have a really cool tour and everything else could be really bad. You could give a really great program and your tour could be really awful. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was to force all of us to think about these five issues comprehensively and simultaneously. And that's why it looks this way. You can see what you're good at and what you're not good at. And you keep reassessing. Because one of the problems is most house museums are not really honest with themselves. They think they have a beautiful collection and their tours are awful, or they have great tours and their collection's bad, or the building, you know, it just goes on and on. No one thinks about it comprehensively. And so a lot of people have just asked, well, what have historic house sites tried? Um, I'm very quickly just going to go through and show you um, different ideas that house museums are starting to try. Now, they're interesting ideas. Have I found one that's kind of comprehensively looking at it from this anarchist perspective? Not necessarily, but house museums are starting to engage in social justice. Our friends at Cliveden are doing some really wonderful work with community engagement, um, issues of um, slavery, the Jane Addams Hall House dealing with um, labor issues. Um, uh, th these are two, three projects um, uh, that I worked on, and what they are are kind of urban scale engagements. Um, Light on Sound, um, actually, there was a poetry um, month-long piece that we put signs up all throughout Flushing. Um, uh, in primer, we primed this historic house, uh, and then it eventually went back to its original color, but we actually engaged people in this conversation. Um, and these bottoms are for special needs programming. Um, I'm a strong believer in hybrid programming, so we overlap site-specific contemporary artists with special needs programming. So for instance, sight impaired and kids on the autism spectrum could actually go and touch the furniture and experience it in a very different way. So when's the last time you heard of a house museum really engaging um, children and families on the autism spectrum? And these families want a place to go to.
and to speak in an awful way. They also have money to do that because they love their children and they're willing to do that. And so the, it, it, it's a good way of kind of overlapping what your, your needs are. Um, this is an interesting one that I started. Um, how would you like to go to a tour of a historic house and someone gives you the Windex and the paper towels and what you do is you actually clean the windows? Um, I, uh, the next one I'm doing is a dusting tour. So people are actually showing, I'm telling you, it worked, people came. Remember that whole notion of keeping it all secret? No, somebody shows up, hand them the Windex, the paper towels, people are taking down the barriers. Also, I've got stats here, people are starting to send me that their um, attendance is up, their positive press is up, believe it or not, their gift shop revenue is up because people feel welcomed. Um, this is interesting, the American Driving Museum, which is in El Segundo, California. That first picture is what these cars were in. They were chained up, and you could only look at them with text boxes. They just this year took the chains down, reorganized them, complete curatorial change, and every Saturday they drive you around in six of the cars. So they've made a complete 180, changed it. Their attendance is through the roof. This is the um, Juliet Gordon Lowe house. They've totally changed, recurated the library. It's now a fully immersive um, activity space for the Girl Scouts. It's really a kind of, um, these are two really good models about, about really keeping what's important and moving on. Um, and, and these are, um, all things that I've been involved with, which are contemporary art projects, site-specific to historic houses that are deeply embedded into the historic narrative. Some of them are um, landmarks um, narratives, others are in New York City. Um, we've done immersive theater um, all throughout the house. And on the bottom are stats where you actually can see attendance rise um, and um, earned revenue rising. It also has um, increased, um, if you look at Wilton, um, he said for the first time in 10 years, their annual appeal has been up for three years straight, 44%, and that's since they started doing the contemporary art site-specific um, pieces. So it's there, it's starting to come in. And then preservation. You know, there are a lot more different ways of dealing with preservation than just making it picture perfect. And then finally, one of the things that I'm doing right now is I'm actually sleeping in historic houses. It's a blog series called Sleeping Around. I'm sleeping in the Eshrick house tomorrow night um, and then talking about all of these issues, these larger community issues, um, while I actually use the houses the way they were meant to be used. And so here we are at the very end. You know, it's really simple. It's dumb simple. What am I asking? I'm asking for us to put in the center. The center's been gutted. That's where all the good stuff is. It's where all the interesting stories are. It's all of the marginalized populations. And when you start to think about this as a kind of reinstituting what really existed, I mean, it's our kind of it's our choice to get rid of those images. And so ultimately, out of the freneticism of all of this stuff that I've shown you, right? ultimately, what we want is a kind of transformation that doesn't lose what's valuable, but engages new constituents. Ultimately, our goal is to have these places around for the future. But one thing that our research is telling us is if we just keep on doing what we're doing, they won't be. And so the suggestion is pick and choose, but be comprehensive, be thorough, and think about your historic site using the kind of five categories. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank, and good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Jonathan Burton. I am the, uh, the executive director for the Philadelphia Society for the Preservation of Landmarks, for which uh, Frank was the director a few, quite a few years ago. Um, and as Ellen mentioned, uh, we will be collecting the anarchist tags. So if everybody's written on the anarchist tags, somebody will be going around right now, as a matter of fact, to collect these tags. Um, and we'll have a little discussion with our, with our moderator tonight. And before I introduce our guest moderator for the discussion period of tonight's program, I want to say that it has been a complete pleasure working with Lucy, Ellen, and Ed from the Fairmount Park Conservancy on this project. And I especially want to thank the Barra Foundation for not only helping to fund tonight's program, but for seeing and understanding the big picture revolving historic house museums 
and other realms of arts and culture in the five county region of, of Philadelphia. Nathaniel Popkin, uh, most of you have probably heard of Nathaniel. He is the writer in residence at the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. Uh, he is a literary writer, editor, historian, journalist, and the author of three books, including the 2013 novel Lion and Leopard. Popkin is the fiction review editor of Clever Magazine. Uh, as a book critic and member of the National Book Critics Circle, his focus is on literary fiction and world literature in translation. He is a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal, Public Books, The Millions, and the Kenyan Review, and an editor-at-large at Head & Hand Press, which is a programming partner for Phila Landmarks. Nathaniel is the founding uh, co-editor of Hidden City Daily, a web magazine that covers architecture, design, planning, and preservation. In 2011-2012, Nathaniel was the guest architecture critic for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Popkin is also a senior writer and story editor of the multi-part documentary film series, Philadelphia the Great Experiment, broadcast on Philadelphia's ABC, 6ABC. His work on the film has been recognized with several Emmy Awards. I'd now like to introduce Nathaniel Popkin. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, wow. Thank you all for coming out here on a, on a spring night. Um, and uh, I guess I'm supposed to go over <laughs> here, right? I'm going to fall off this. OK. Uh, I think on behalf of, of, of the conservancy, of the park, uh, of the city, um, and, and everyone who brought you here, I, I want to thank you, because you have substantially helped everyone in this room, at least conceptually, reframe the issue of what to do with not just the historic mansions of, of Fairmount Park, uh, but the enormous uh, historic uh, infrastructure of Philadelphia. And, and I say that, and you made, that's why I was saying you made such a great segue here with this film. Isn't it great? Well, it's great for a real reason, because this film signifies, as it was made at the end of the 1940s, the moment in which Philadelphia decided to get rid of its middle story. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. And that is, declare itself a modern city and a colonial city, and forget about what it really was, most substantially, uh, which was a 19th century city of working class and immigrant people. Um, and one of the challenges, as I understand preservation, and as I understand urbanism, is to make sense of that missing middle. So I think it's, it's enormously important as we approach what to do with old buildings that we don't forget about the main story or stories or narratives, uh, even when they're complicated and even when they're uh, contradictory and even when they're very, very complex, we cannot forget them, otherwise we're losing exactly who we are as a city. So. Um, all that said, I have some questions for you, and, and, I, and, um, and we can talk a little bit. And then, uh, as I think Ellen has said, hopefully you guys have written down some questions, and uh, folks will collect them, we'll sort them out, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make sure they get to Frank, and, and we'll do it that way. So the, the most important thing I, I think I see here is the question of what are we talking about? We have a collection in Fairmont Park of uh, uh, eight or nine or ten houses. Not they're all. Some of them are owned by different agencies, or at least under different agencies' um, uh, management. Um, they all do different things. Um, and the question is, what are they for? Are they? Are we concerned about them because they're they have something historic about them, and they are buildings that we need to figure out how to preserve? Are they? places where we want to get people into them, like you just talked about, and excite them? Or are we supposed to be thinking about using them and leveraging them for the future of, and the vitality of Fairmount Park and of the city of Philadelphia? How do we assess that question? How do we decide what is what we should be focusing on? Well, I think it's probably all of the above. Um, and remember, uh, I did. I just left running 23 house museums in New York City, um, and so it's a public-private organization, so it's very much like this organization. Um, and every house had its own 501c3. So I had the city, the mayor, the parks commissioner, then I had my own board of directors, and then every house had its board of directors. 
Um, and so the operational thing is, is very strong. There's always been this push in me, and I had it back when I was at Landmarks, that, that, that house museums are very territorial. Even within an organization, they're going after the same money, right? The reason why I start with money is, is because in so many cases, um, house museums and historic sites refuse to collectively sit down together and decide the very thing that you're asking. What would be ideal in a situation is that there's a kind of cooperative, right? That everybody sits down, it's like, hey, we've got this, you've got that, you've got that, we think this will be really good with that, that there's a comprehensive quality about it. My, my answer for your question is, each one is probably slightly different. I doubt all of these houses should all be house museums. Right. I would say I doubt all 23 of the houses in New York City that I ran should all be house museums. But these things kind of snowball and they just kind of happen. There are, there are over 15,000 house museums in the United States. Should they all be house museums? We purposely didn't get involved in that conversation because I find it a smokescreen. How about each house museum figure out what their value comes from? Mm -hmm. You know, so for me, it's kind of a roundabout way that you really need a kind of comprehensive understanding of what each of these houses does, has mm -hmm. this history, what its neighborhood is like, what its constituency can be. So it's complicated, as you just said. Um, yeah, and I think it's whenever there's multiple agencies and multiple owners yeah. and, and managers and every, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. The question is, what are we doing this for? Uh, and I suspect that we want to do it because we want to make life in Fairmount Park better and life in the city of Philadelphia better. Um, and we have these wonderful places that could, we could further their stabilization and further their preservation by getting people inside of them and using them for various different things. Absolutely. I, I, I assume that's why we're all well, let here. Let me say, so, so, but then also I'll hover above that and say what no one will say. I'm the museum anarchist after all that if you could choose all of these sites to be house museums at this moment, which ones would you choose? And a lot of times the house museums that exist now, even the ones that have been torn down, are simply because the family had money. It's, it, they're the houses that were lucky enough to history to end up, you know? In some ways, and that's a very, that's a very internal conversation, you know? Um, but, but it is one, you know, one pushback could be the reason why this is such an important conversation is because these are community assets. They exist. They're owned by the city. They're ours, in other words. They're yours. You, yeah. got, you got to do something with them, right? That's the most kind of, right. you know, um, basic idea. Now, above that, of course, they have value and all that other stuff that we know. But at the most basic level, you own them. So um, my second question is, is sort of a two-parter. Uh, a lot of what you were talking about in your presentation is about the issue of distance. That is, you go into one of these houses, you feel no attachment to what's inside, you're bored, the lives of the people that uh, live there and the way uh, the, the uh, house is being interpreted seems distant from you, it's not connected to me and my life. Well, that all may be the case, and I'm not entirely sure. I'm not going to speak for the houses of Fairmount Park. But there's a secondary issue here in both the struggle to define what is community around these houses and in accessing them at all. Because none of them actually have a neighborhood around them. They're, I looked at them on Google Maps today, and they're all substantially separated from Philadelphia neighborhoods. Um, they're separated from each other. They're hard to find. Getting around Fairmont Park is not easy. No. There's public transportation <laughs> in and out of Fairmont Park is, an, is a complete disaster. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. We got lost three times, <laughs> three times getting to the house today. Uh, and there's nothing intuitive about the process. Yeah. So we've got two, two issues here. If, you, if you're thinking about you know, deconstructing the interpretation of the house so that it connects to a community, well, there isn't one. And if you're talking about just getting people there so they can take part, what do you do? 
You, so, and the so, landscape is the biggest element here. Well, don't, don't mistake my notions of community as being just physical community. Um, uh, it is far greater than just that. And mm -hmm. we talk about reverse affinity groups in the book. Um, that's mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. um, we, t we were at Ball Mansion, you know, like Ball canning jars. It was their mansion in Muncie, Indiana. And the same thing, they don't, it's the exact same thing that we're talking about here. Um, and their question was, well, who's our community? What are we doing? And we determined their community was actually on the other side of the river because most of the people who were doing canning were less advantaged people on the other side of the river and they actually did that. They actually used the stuff, not that other people don't. I'm just using it as an example. So the reverse affinity groups looking up and meet up what groups are doing and then offering that as part of your house, pulling them in. I would also push back and say, just because these houses are in parks doesn't mean that they don't have physical communities associated with them because Strawberry Mansion has an entire section called Strawberry Mansion. True now, enough. is Strawberry Mansion the house museum? Reflective of Strawberry Mansion, the physical part of the city? I don't think. Nor its history. At all, right. But it does have the same name. And as I said, I photographed 33rd Street as I went to Strawberry Mansion. It has a community. And I'm not picking on Strawberry Mansion. It's just where I, yeah. we've been for two yeah. days. Um, it's just the one that I know really well. Not really well, but you know. So, so I would say that on both of those counts, I would push back a bit. Um, and, and you have to expand your notion of what community is, how you would gain community. And probably in Philadelphia for these houses, the geographic distance of what that community is. You're not the Latimer house in the middle of Flushing, New York, um, with, with so many people within six blocks that it could sustain your house. Okay, so uh, one last thing, and then we'll turn to um, your questions and, and uh, take some time with that. So how do you, how does the process work for, um, you know, the management of, of a house who is facing um, physical deterioration, the need to replace a roof? Um, I, I was looking at Lemon Hill the other day. Clearly, there's some work that's needed to be done. Lemon Hill is the house that's closest to center city Philadelphia and most easily um, uh, leveraged in some ways for, for some exciting programming. But the, we have to make a decision. How do you s turn a switch so that we could maybe uh, suspend some of the immediate needs so that you can create programs that might create a revenue stream that can therefore later, I mean, how do you make that happen? How, how have you seen that happen? Right. Um, I would say that go back to that matrix from, and I'll just use my book, you can use anything, I don't care what you use. Um, but there's a kind of comprehensive understanding of everything that's going on, and you have to prioritize. It's one thing that we as executive directors all do, that we, we juggle all of these variables at one time. If the roof is leaking, you got to stop the water from leaking. Now, does that mean that you have to replace it with slate exactly the way it is right now? No, but you have to stop the water leak. Mm -hmm. Like, that's one of the things that um, uh, one of my good friends um, added a quote in the book, and that was that sometimes the best thing to do is grab duct tape in a historic house museum because that solves the immediate crisis. It lets you think about the bigger picture without you having to worry about the $50,000 preparatory study that needs to happen. Um, so in, in, in my case, I would say that um, funders and money started coming in for all sorts of things when they realized that community engagement was serious. That you're not just doing it so that you can get the funding. So again, it's not a one-off. It's not just a cool program. You know, those special needs programs were not just one-off programs. I started the Wagner Special Needs Program at HHT. It's now in its fifth year, and there are continuous events. Those are the sorts of things that do bring attention and money to the organization. It, it really does mean that they have to stand back and think comprehensively. If, for instance, this is a situation that's crisis, of course, you need to, you need to think about everything and stop the water mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Um, but um, 
Too often what happens is an organization thinks, oh my God, we've got to replace the roof. And they spend the next six years raising enough money to replace the roof in Slate. Meanwhile, their attendance is down to 41 people a month, you know, and their tours are awful and their volunteers are dwindling. That's because they only thought of one of those categories. Good, okay. Yeah? Yeah. All right, so these are cura pre-curated? All right. And these are anonymous. <laughs> he says that with the first one. Wait a minute. No one will be in trouble. <laughs> this is it. I like this. Uh, do you think the professionalization of the field has driven up the costs of preservation? If so, what is the solution? Yes. And I think the solution is really pushing forward a more nuanced um, understanding for small historic sites and house museums about what preservation actually can be. Most boards on small organizations want to do the right thing. We know that. These are good people. They, they know they're stewards of these sites. They want to do the right thing. And as best they know, the right thing is Monticello and Mount Vernon. And so the best thing is to do a $50,000 paint analysis, even though you don't have 60 bucks to buy a gallon of paint. What, what we have to do is we have to allow them a more nuanced understanding of preservation from, from a professional perspective, because whether we like it or not, preservation is a professional um, uh, kind of mandate. They need, they need these boards, which are all volunteer, need to feel that it is okay to choose to not preserve something to its purest state. Not every site really deserves that. All right, um, and, and following up, um, That's on the other funny. hand, well, right, and yeah. there are people in this audience that would disagree with you. I know that. Um, um, I'm so. looking at Frank Matera <laughs> right there. <laughs> I agree with you. Oh, okay, good, okay, good. Um, That's good. So, but, 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 <laughs> what? That's not supposed to happen. Um, <laughs> but, yes, so. but, 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 yes. I mean, there is, there are, so, before you all arrived here, I, the, um, in the back, um, we have some images of the Fairmount Park houses on the table back there with the, cur with the curator and conservator who's standing there. Hello. Um, and the first thing I do is to pick up a photograph of the uh, Powell House. And I pick it up. And I'm told, <laughs> you've made a great error. <laughs> I can't pick up the photograph because, of course, it's, a, it's an object that it needs to be conserved. So there's a reality to that. And me picking up that photograph was wrong because it potentially could compromise it. There are fragile things. There is even architectural things that cannot be messed with and should not be messed with. So where does that line go? The, the question, as it exactly reads, is how do you protect the objects, china, books, paintings, et cetera? Um, you answer the phone first, and then <laughs> I say this all the time. If something is so extremely valuable, then put it in a museum. And then the thing that happens next is somebody from the audience goes, oh, these are museums. No, these are houses that have been turned into public venues. They're not museums. They usually don't have the security. They don't have the staffing. They usually don't have enough curatorial help to actually manage really expensive things. Most house museums cannot manage really, really expensive things. So I'm surprised that you do not recommend changing the name. I thought of this earlier. Yeah. Why are we calling them museums? Why are we calling them historic? Right. If we're kind of thinking more broadly about what they could be. Because that has more power when they decide that than me tell them. Um, no, the truth is, I don't believe these are museums. I think that's the problem. We've tried to turn them into art museums. We've tried to turn them into the Fisk Kimball Art Museum. Um, and that's the way it stayed, period. And they're really not. They're really about habitation in houses. OK. Some of them, Bosco Bell, can be full of Duncan Fife furniture, if that's what you want. I mean, some of them can be that great stuff. I love pretty things, right? I just do, but not all of them need to be that. OK. Sorry. Good, fine. Um, okay, a couple of really nice questions here. Um, 
do the people coming to these programs, such as your cleaning one, the window yeah. cleaning one, do they come back? I love that question. That question is always paired with, yes, but how many members does that program actually bring in? Well, well the answer is, I go, none. Do you know why? Because most membership programs are bottoming out. The membership model works for the dying generation. Most younger generations do not want to be a part of an organization in a way that um, kind of membership allowed. Like it's a very different association with a group. I mean, you know, I, I use this analogy all the time. When I was little, we went to Kmart and the blue light specials, and they were at the, the you went to the blue light specials? Yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, you'd go to the cash register and everybody would stand in line and you'd get the blue light special. Now you go to the Apple store and just find anybody with a blue or red shirt and you can buy anything. That's the world we're in, that it's decentralized. Um, and, so, and so I feel like, um, generationally, um, things have changed so much that people aren't interested in filing in line and being, being a part of a kind of organization in a traditional way. So figure out a new way to make money that used to make you money as membership because I consult on this. Most membership projects you know, in organizations are losing money. When you consider the amount of labor and the freebies and the swag and all of that that you send out, it usually loses money. Th that's interesting because in, uh, I spend a lot of time in the journalism world and uh, in fact even legacy journalism uh, outlets like The Guardian uh, from England, which has a substantial US uh, base, uh, they are using the membership terminology to get people to become part of what they're doing. At Hidden City, many of you in this audience are probably members of of Hidden City Philadelphia and contribute in, to sustaining our website and um, our tour program and membership means something. So, why so for does... Instance, how, um, how much is membership to Hidden City? $35. $35. Um, and um, I know Hidden City and I mean it's all edgy stuff. It, it, it appeals, it appeals to all of us, right, but it also, it also leans towards a certain demographic. It seems to, Yes. but we have a very wide demographic. <laughs> so I would say the very quality of what you are giving and providing already leans to a certain demographic Possibly. that it's okay, okay, that it works. And it's interesting that newspapers would start to adopt membership and they're dropping subscription. Right. Right. They're, just, they're switching that's terminology. Be, well, that, that, that's because of the internet. No one wants yeah. to pay a subscription to, to look at that. That's right, because most people don't want to pay. In genealogy, you know, the sites that are increasing are the ones that you don't pay for. Because most people just want to find out about their granddad and move on. They don't want to become a member of a genealogical society. This is kind of an observation, but I'd like you to respond to it. It's a very a smart one. Uh, this book, <laughs> f forgive the next clause. Oh, no. Like most consultants, yeah, go right ahead. Mi <laughs> we're, we're telling the truth over here. Mi I told him, I said, don't hold anything back. Misestimates the pace of organizational change and the difficulty, perhaps, as well. Okay, I'll, I'll respond. Yep. I am not a consultant. I just started consulting, but I have for the last 20 something years been in the trenches running some very difficult situations and dealing in New York City very complex organizational structures um, with budgets that were very tight. I would respond and say that that is just not true. I do understand organizational change. I think it's fabulous that in 10 years, landmarks has moved in the direction that you've been moving it in and has substantial changes in their operations that really were started not only with me but with Matt before, with, with other things. I clearly understand. The problem here is that, I'll, I'll send it back to this person. Whoever you can sit be. back and say that organizational change is very slow with nonprofits and I'll say fine, you come back to me in 10 years and tell me how that's working for you. Because I'm not so sure you have 10 years. 
I'm sitting here with 20 something years experience with historic sites and that's one of the reasons I decided to write the book with Deb is you don't have that much time. There's real issues here that are, that are, that are not going to be solved in a kind of slow gradual change. That's my response. I think it's probably pretty <laughs> legit. <laughs> We're but, gonna, we're, but I will also say that I have all the bruises and scars and bad memories of all of that change. Okay, we're gonna <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna end on one last thing before we go downstairs and drink those uh, yes. um, special yeah. <laughs> special uh, spirits. Um, let's start, end on something fun. Okay. All right. So. I mean, you know, they, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to have like sleepover pajama night at the uh, baseball field uh, in Camden across the way. Kids would go there, they probably, I don't even know. There's even pajama day at yeah. school. Um, so let people live in the houses. Yeah. Yes, how? Well, again, or just it's, yes, it's a, I don't know. No, don't, don't just at all, because I think, I think it's a very reasonable thing having, um, I say all the time, you know, it's a really great thing to have a resident artist every year producing work, live work experiences, having exhibits at the house, opening it up once a month as part of their, their um, abilities. That, that would bring so many houses very quickly up to relevancy. You're shaking your head because you know that's true, right? Artists love those opportunities, you know? So, so for me, it's not that outrageous. Yep. You know, I don't, you know, what's outrageous is for people to think that they have to empty out several rooms to be able to have an artist to do live work situations and then have exhibit space in the spaces. Excellent. Well, I think we should all give Frank a, a real strong round of applause. Let me see those questions. <laughs> no, 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 no.